Good morning, Good morning. and welcome to the Combined Worship Services of McDougall and Ogden United Churches here on this gorgeous July 23rd morning. Thank you for being here, whether you are here in person, whether you are watching online, and whether you are watching on Sunday, or watching on Wednesday, or Thursday, or the night before cramming for the exam that comes on Sunday morning. A few announcements to lift up as we gather here this morning. First off, we are looking for... There we go. Oh, there we go. Looking for two people to help remove the bulletin board where the reconciliation mural is to be hung and then to help hang the mural afterwards. So uh, the bulletin board can be removed in August with the mural being hung in early September. And if you are able to help out with that, please either contact Sarah at uh, the email address on the screen or fill out the volunteer sign-up sheet on the uh, website. Uh, it shouldn't be arduous work, but it's definitely more than a one-person job. Um, it's just uh, the removal of a bulletin board and preparation and hanging of a mural. Um, removal of the bulletin board in August, preparation, in, or preparation and hanging of the mural in September. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to the office. They should be able to let you know more. Again, two people, maybe a third, depending, um, but, uh, or two people and a supervisor. That's also permitted. Um, yeah. Next announcement, just a reminder that there is no kids' table over the summer, no, uh, no Sunday school or children's programming over the summer. However, there are tables at the back of the church with a number of different supplies and uh, um, artistic expression tools required for folks who would like to color or draw or express themselves artistically, not just children. I recommend checking out of the sermon altogether and just going back and drawing a duck. Or whatever you want to draw, I guess. Uh, Summer Singers Time Change. I like the way that this announcement was written, so I'm going to read it off, at least the first sentence anyway, off of the page that I've got here. The people have spoken, it says. The people have spoken. 9.30 was too early. Man. Y'all are past your school days, aren't you? The people have spoken. 9.30 was too early. Please join Tanya on Sundays throughout the rest of July and August at 9.45. There you go, folks. You won your 15 minutes. Or two hits of snooze on my watch. Uh, but 9.45 now, we will gather on Sunday mornings if you would like to go through the hymns and uh, join us for the Sunday Singers. It's I can't stress how important it actually ends up being. It may seem like such a weird, benign thing, but it means a lot to have folks come in and come and sit and, and help lead the, the music on Sunday morning. Nobody wants it to be the Bill Weaver Comedy Hour. It's really quite miserable. We appreciate Jen's gifts, like unbelievably appreciate Jen's gifts, but it's nice to have other folks as well. It feels more like community worship when we have community voices singing community hymns together. So thank you to everybody who does come up and, and sing um, for, through the Sunday Singers. It's not a huge requirement. It doesn't need to be an every week thing, but it does mean a lot. And it is one way, that, one way of many that, that folks give back to the life of this church. And we are grateful for that, which really feels like a great segue into the next slide. Because there are many ways that you all give of yourselves and your time. See what I did there? You cannot plan that. There are so many ways that you give of yourselves. So many ways that you share of your time and your talents, your offerings, your skills, all of it. And one of the many ways that you support the life and work of our churches is through your giving. So we are grateful for all the ways in which you give of yourself, including your financial gifts. And if you are here in the sanctuary and would like to make an offering, there are plates at the back of the church to do so. Or whether you are here in person or at home watching, the ways to give are on the screen um, to do so remotely. We are grateful. And it is through your faithful and tireless work and support that we are able to do so much for so many. So thank you from the bottom of our hearts for all the ways in which you love and serve these communities and all the ways in which you continue to keep our churches lights of hope and lights of compassion and safe spaces for people to gather and be together in meaningful relationship. Thank you. And so with that, I'm going to invite you to just take a moment and breathe. Close your eyes and breathe in this space. And we'll remain seated as we sing our gathering hymn, 
gather us in. continue today with our journey through the book of Acts and the stories of the early church as told by the writer of Luke's gospel. As we light our Christ candle this morning, we light it remembering that the light of Christ is something that breaks through all of the dark, troubling, dissenting, frustrating moments of our lives. The light burns especially bright when we gather in community as followers of Jesus and followers of the way. Because the light that is in each of us is brought to bear more fully in community. We'll hear the story today of disagreements, disagreements in the community, the gathered community of early followers of Jesus. And we will hear not only the stories of how grace and compassion and God's work of mercy and love wins the day, but how even in that triumph, there is still the human failings of personalities and politics and problems. And so as we gather in the light of Christ today, may we look at this light and remember that the one who follows us does not abandon us. 
that even here today, in the triumphs and in the problems, Christ is with us. Amen. And so I'm going to invite you all to stand as you're able and we will sing our opening hymn, Let Us Build a House. Let's sing together. And so friends, as we gather in our opening prayer, I invite you to say the parts that are printed in black in response to the parts that I will read that are printed in yellow. Let us pray together. God, who defies expectations, we confess that sometimes in our need to feel we belong, in our haste to find places of safety and comfort, we sometimes close the door on others.
Forgive us, loving God, and open our minds and our hearts that there might be room for the Spirit to enter in. And so we gather all our prayers, spoken and unspoken, into the one prayer that Jesus taught us as we sing. We have this part in the service that's called the assurance of grace. And every week I stand up here and I tell you, I feel like the same thing, and I hope that it doesn't come off like a broken record because it's probably the most important thing to remember about God's love and grace is that it is, it is assured. You are loved. Full stop. End of story. God loves you, whoever you are. Does not matter where you find yourself in life. Does not matter the choices you have made does not matter the struggles you are facing. You are not alone and God loves you. You are precious in God's sight. You are a child of God and you are loved. In the places that you're getting it right, God loves you. In the places you are getting it wrong, God loves you. You're picked up and you get to do it all over again and again and again. And God's love never fades and God's, God's love never fails and you will never, ever walk alone. This is the promise of God. This is the assurance of God's grace. From now until the end of time, you are loved. Thanks be to God. Amen. And so this time, I'm going to invite you to stand as you are able. We are going to pass the peace with one another. The peace of Christ be with you and also with you. Those are the words. You can do it with a handshake. You can do it with a hug. You can do it with the gestures we have used through the pandemic wherever you find yourself today. However it is you want to do it, let us pass the peace to one another that we may be of one heart and one mind and one community here in this space. The peace of Christ be with you, friends, and also with you. Peace be with you, sir. Peace be with you. And before we all sit down and get comfortable again, we'll remain standing as we sing our next hymn, Be Thou My Vision.
And so, friends, as we gather in our time of prayer, I invite you to lift up any prayers you may be holding in your hearts. Certainly, we pray for folks on the East Coast dealing with flooding, loss of property, loss of safety and security, a great deal of uncertainty. Pray for folks here closer to home who are still dealing with the aftermath of some of the very strange hailstorms that we had in the recent weeks. And as we pray today, we will do as we did last week. We will sing and then pray and then sing and then pray and then sing again. So I invite you as we enter into our time of prayer to sing with me like a rock. of comfort, safety, love, and provision. How can we not give you thanks for all of the blessings of life? For all those places and people where we feel rooted, anchored and truly alive and loved. For the beauty of the world around us, for the beauty of creation and the wonder and mystery of life. For relationships that build us up. care and compassion of friends and family, the warmth of hugs and handshakes and hellos, the gift of presence, for all of the ways in which you bless our lives, in which we come to know your love in the love of others. We give you thanks, O God. And so we sing. God, we are also mindful that not everything for all people is as it should be, as you would have it be. Pray for all of those living in places of danger and violence, those living in the shadow of oppression and war. Pray for families who wonder where their next meal will come from. Those gripped by loneliness and grief. Those questioning their purpose or their worth. Those living in fear and anxiety.
all those who wake up this morning exhausted, unsure if they have it in them to continue the struggle another day. All of those abiding deeply in the valley of the shadow of death. All of those who have gone before us into your presence. And all of those who will come after us to this place when we are gone. God, we ask that you would keep us mindful, that our hearts and our hands might be open to serve and love in your name. That by our work and by our love, we might be the light of hope and the promise of your grace all the days of our life, trusting that you are with us and we abide in your presence every step of the way as we sing. Like a rock, like a rock, God is under our feet. Like a starry night sky, God is over our head. Like the sun on the horizon, God is ever before. Like the river runs to ocean, Today's reading come from Priests for Equality, the Inclusive Bible. And the lessons are from, excuse me, are selected verses from the book of Acts, chapter 15. Then some Jewish Christians came down to Antioch and began to teach the believers, unless you follow exactly the traditions of Moses, you cannot be saved. Paul and Barnabas strongly disagreed with them and hotly debated this position. Finally, it was decided that Paul, Barnabas, and some others should go up to see the apostles and elders in Jerusalem about this question. All the members of the church saw them off, and they made their way through Phoenicia and Samaria. Paul and Bar Barnabas told how the Galileans, or excuse me, how the Gentiles had been converted. Their story was received with great joy among the sisters and brothers. When Paul's group arrived in Jerusalem, they were welcomed by that church and by the apostles and the elders, to whom they gave an account of all that God had accomplished through them. Some of the converted Pharisees got up and demanded that Gentiles be forced to convert to Judaism first before being baptized and be told to follow the laws of Moses. Accordingly, the apostles and elders convened to look into the matter. After much discussion, Peter said to them, Friends, you know that God chose me from among your midst a long time ago, so that the Gentiles would hear the message of the gospel from my lips and believe. God, who can read everyone's heart, or witness to this by granting the Holy Spirit to them as the Spirit has been granted to us. God made no distinction, but purified their hearts as well by means of faith. Why then do you put God to the test by, excuse me, by trying to place on the shoulders of these converts a yoke which neither we nor our ancestors were able to bear? But just as we believe, we are saved through the grace of Jesus Christ, so are they. When they finished their presentation, James spoke up. Sisters and brothers, listen to me, he said. Simon has told you how God initially became concerned about taking 
from among the Gentiles a people for God's name. But it is my judgment, therefore, that we shouldn't make it more difficult for Gentiles who are turning to God. After some time, Paul said to Barnabas, let's return to all the cities where we preached the word of God and see how they are doing. Barnabas suggested taking John Mark along with them as well. But Paul said no, because he had deserted them in Palinthia and, it, <clears throat> and had not continued to work with them. The disagreement between Paul and Barnabas grew so sharp that they parted company. Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus. Paul chose Silas and left after being commended by the brothers and sisters of the grace of God. Paul traveled through Syria and Cilicia, consolidating the churches along the way. Learn from these words and understand their meaning. talk about the things we've gone through though it's hurting me now it's history I've played all my cards and that's what you've done too nothing more to say no more ace to play The winner takes it all The loser standing small Beside the victory That's our destiny I was in your arms Thinking I belonged there I figured it made sense Building me a fence Building me a home Thinking I'd be strong there But I was a fool Playing by the rules The gods may throw their minds as cold as ice And someone way down here Loses someone dear The winner takes it all The loser has to fall It's simple and it's plain Why should I complain? Like I used to kiss you Does it feel the same When she calls your name Hi, somewhere deep inside You must know I miss you But what can I say The rules must be obeyed the judges will decide The mics of me abide Spectators of the show Always keeping low The game is on again A lover or a friend A big thing talk if it makes you feel sad and I understand you've come to shake my hand 
I apologize If it makes you feel bad Seeing me so tense No self-confidence The winner takes it All right, who had singing ABBA in church on your bingo card? You can mark off that square. We've been following the early church through the book of Acts for a number of weeks now. It feels like an eternity ago that it was Pentecost. And we've been following over the past couple of weeks in particular the story first of the, the, the conversion that wasn't a conversion of Paul and then the conversion that was not a conversion of Cornelius. And I, I promised you that this was actually kind of part of a larger story that kind of ended in some controversy today, um, which it does. Uh, but in good biblical fashion, it doesn't seem that controversial in the writing of the text. So I want to unpack it a bit for you to begin with because I try to keep my promises as much as possible. We heard a couple of weeks ago about Paul on the road to Damascus having his Jesus moment where he is struck blind. Paul being a faithful uh, persecutor of the early Christian movement has an encounter with Jesus that leaves him blind and heavily reliant on a disciple of Jesus to heal him. And in so doing, Paul actually becomes a follower of the way of Jesus and goes on to be a prominent leader in the early church. Meanwhile, as we heard last week, Peter, also a prominent leader in the early church, finds himself asked to go to the home of an Italian centurion uh, where he should not be and where they customarily would not have been, um, where the Holy Spirit descends upon the entire household and Peter is left with no choice in his heart or in his mind but to baptize the entire household despite the fact they are all Gentile and up until that point, there was no belief that the way of Jesus was intended for the Gentile community. And so in Acts chapter 11 and chapter 12, we start to hear about the fallout in smaller kind of gatherings. First, Peter has to actually go back to his community of folks and explain his actions, and they question heavily why it is that he would baptize a Gentile household until he goes through and tells them the whole story. I didn't want to make you read the whole story again, because it is almost word for word in Acts 11 what is written in Acts 10, except that it says, Peter said, and then they repeat it. But after he explains to them what happens in the household of Cornelius, they go, oh, okay, well, then if the spirit is involved, then I guess we're okay with it. But apparently not everybody is, because in Acts chapter 15, it opens with news that there are certain individuals from Judea, another community, uh, that have arrived in Antioch. And our inclusive Bible reading makes it very nice that they must follow all of the laws of Moses if they are going to be followers of the way of Jesus. That they must, in fact, uh, convert to Judaism first before they can be baptized into the way of Jesus. But what we're really talking about here is one thing in particular, and that is circumcision. Now, I'm not going to lie to you, men hear this part of the story differently than women. <laughs> it might be right that I'm up here talking about it. That you must be circumcised before you can follow Jesus, is basically what they are arguing. And follow all the other laws as well. But the question that is facing the church still, despite the fact that Paul has heard it 
and understood it, despite the fact that Peter has explained it time and time again, and people have heard it and understood it, is if the saving work of Jesus Christ is intended for all people or only for those who are law observant. And so as we hear in the book of, cha- or the book of Acts chapter 15, this question continues to inspire what they say in the, in the text, no small dissension and debate. It seems like not that long ago we were hearing that the church was all of one mind and the followers shared everything equally. And yet here we are five chapters later hearing that there is no small dissension and debate. And worse yet, no consensus emerges, which they have depended on up until this point. No consensus emerges. And so the church sends Paul and Barnabas, who have been together for a very long time through the book of Acts. Paul, the man converted on the road to Damascus, is now sent to Jerusalem to a council of all of the church leaders. And these are not... um, These are not just sort of local people. These are the the leaders of the church universal as it is known in that time. And they discuss and they debate. And eventually they come to a resolution. And I don't want to lose out on a few important things that I think need to be said about this passage that teaches us how we can potentially be effectively church together, especially when it comes to differences and debate. Because there are a number of pieces that are modeled in this council that sometimes I wonder if we are barely holding on to in our living and our work together. The first thing that I would like to highlight is that the conversation is broadened beyond those who agree and those who disagree. Friends, the church in and of itself is a local kind of a body. This, in some ways, is very much the church that most of us know and love, right here, right? This gathered community of believers, two gathered communities of believers right now. But this, for most people, I think, is the entire church experience right here, the relationships with the people that sit beside you on a Sunday morning who minister and work with you at the various programs and offerings and opportunities that are provided in the life of the church. But we're also kind of aware that there is a broader sense of the church, right? Not even just the United Church of Canada, even, right? But the, the broader Church of Jesus Christ in Canada, the broader Church of Jesus Christ in North America, the, the broader Church of Jesus Christ the world over, right? The conversation is broadened because more voices are needing to be brought into this conversation. So when the dispute arises in Antioch with people from Judea, the church at Antioch sends its leaders to Jerusalem. And we're going to go talk about it there so that more voices can be a part of this discussion. I think the most important thing that I take away from this reading myself is the importance of experience and testimony. I was driving the other day on the Deerfoot and my 13-year-old daughter was riding shotgun. She's the only one who's old enough to ride shotgun. Everyone else has to sit in the back seats, but she's old enough now that she gets to ride up front and she wears it like a badge on her sleeve and tries to find reasons that she can come for a ride with her siblings so that she can point out to them that she gets to sit in the front while they're all stuck in the back. And so one of the things that I've been doing is kind of showing her because we're not that far away from when she might say, hey, can I get my learner's permit? Which I am not ready for. But I've been trying to show her a few things that hopefully she'll absorb because she never listens to me when I tell her anything directly. So I've been pointing out to her when we drive places, uh, oh, that person's about to, you know, pull over into my lane long before it happens, right? Oh, that person's going to fly up on the left side and cut us off. Or, oh, watch over that person. He's about to hit his brakes because he's going too fast. And she, she's constantly amazed. I'm some kind of prophet 
in my own time, right? How do you know that he's going to turn right? He has not turned on his signal yet, right? Experience matters, right? Well, because I've been doing this a long time. And let's be honest, you all have been doing it longer than I have, right? But you start to know these things. Experience matters. Experience matters not just in how we drive on the deer foot. Experience matters in what we come to know and understand. One of the greatest gifts, I think, of my early years of ministry was that in my preparation for ministry, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was happening in real time. where I was able to hear stories from people who lived it, as opposed to the academic work of reading about it after the fact. And it's important to bring the voice of experience into any of our discussions and our disagreements and our dissension and our conflicts, because experience matters, right? The conversation is broadened to include more voices, and the voice of experience matters in the conversation. And so, out of this council in Acts chapter 15, those in Jerusalem come to a decision. They come to a decision that the Gentiles do not need to be circumcised in order to follow the way of Jesus. That may feel like a pretty benign decision in our day and age, but it was monumental in theirs that Jesus was for more than just the law observant in Jesus' time. I imagine that those people sitting around that council table became very aware that they were beneficiaries of something much bigger than themselves in that moment, that they were the first to truly experience the, the wideness of God's love, the breadth of God's love. And they recognize that God is at work in extending mercy far beyond what was conventionally known to be the borders of God's love. The church throughout its history has had many more opportunities to experience that kind of mind-altering, heart-altering, circle-expanding witness to the love of God. All of it long before my time. By the time I showed up on the scene, let's be honest, women were already preaching and doing it better than men. Or at least as equally good. Dana's here. <laughs> He's a good preacher too. I should say, Dana's here today, guys. And we are glad to have you back in the room, brother. But for what it's worth, the argument that the council was trying to decide was not about whether or not God was doing a new thing. I think perhaps in first century early Christian way understanding God was always doing a new thing. They got it better than even we do, I think, today. They understood it. The argument that they were around the table debating was whether or not God is doing what God has always done, showing mercy and creating a people for God's self where no people existed before. in Gentile communities, in communities that were largely assumed to be cut off from the understanding and the love of God. From the start of the Christian church, it seems to have been important for leaders to see themselves as staying within the received traditions and not moving outside of them. I am grateful for every church leader that has come before me that has pushed the boundaries push the boundaries on church, push the boundaries on what it means to be Christian community, and push the circle wider than ever before. The other important thing to remember about the conversation 
that happened in Jerusalem is that while experience mattered, so too did one other thing, scripture. There is a peace in the long deliberation of the Jerusalem Council where after Peter has spoken and after Paul has spoken and after all the voices of experience have spoken and after all of the people arguing against Gentile involvement in the way of Jesus have spoken, James stands up and recites from the book of Amos. And from the book of Amos, he recites a passage that actually lends itself to the idea that God is doing a new thing in the Gentile community. Part of the struggle with going through the book of Acts in such great detail and such broad scope is I don't want to keep you here forever reading the entire chapter. But go home and read it. It's really quite amazing how the voices against and the voices for speak, and then James stands up and says, we have heard Peter speak to his experience, and I am reading from, he doesn't say from the book of Amos, but I'm reading from scripture where it says this. And then everybody is decided. When experience and scripture come together in a way that it lines up and opens up a newer understanding than they had from their component parts before. When I was in seminary, I had a prof who said that, uh, so my prof was an Irish Catholic. I'll say that up front so that nobody thinks that this is a discriminatory thing that he's saying. Um, he was an Irish Catholic and a devout Irish Catholic uh, who was teaching a bunch of United Church students in this particular course. And he said, in his mind, the biggest thing that Protestants fear is anything that unifies them. And the biggest thing that Catholics fear is anything that separates them. So here we have this moment in Acts chapter 15 where the council comes to a decision and everybody for a brief glimpse of a moment is again of one mind and the same mind sharing in the same understanding and the same vision. And then the very next verse says that Paul and Silas have an argument. And in fact, Paul and, Sil or Paul and Barnabas rather have an argument. And Paul and Barnabas have been together for the last five chapters, traveling throughout the known world, building up the church everywhere they go. And they have an argument over whether or not one person is allowed to come with them on the next leg of the journey. And Paul cannot agree with Barnabas. And they split. They part company. and they go in separate directions to continue their missionary journeys apart from one another. As I said last week, I'll say it again, there is no new story in the church. Every single time we think we have it figured out, something will come along to create that dissension again. And we continue to debate. And we continue to wonder. But if the story tells us anything, in my mind, it tells us that the better decisions are made when we come together to make them together. With our shared experience, our shared reading of scripture, our shared understanding of the issues at hand. Because as soon as it is left to Paul and Barnabas to sort things out on their own again, they fight and they split. And they are divided for the rest of the story from that point on. No particular gems of wisdom on this one. Just a reminder that your experience matters, that we are better in conversation when we share our experience with each other, and that as people of God, the best decisions we can make are the ones that we make together. This may be your experience of the church, but it's a pretty awesome experience when we all share it together and share of ourselves in it together. So may we have meaningful conversations. May we wrestle with the issues of our day in grace and charity and virtue, bringing all of ourselves to the forefront. And may we continue to push the circle of God's love ever wider to include more and more who exist on the fringes. And if I dare say so, may we finish with the book of Acts fairly soon. 
because it's been a really long time working through the stories of the early church. <laughs> Thanks be to God. Amen. So I'm going to ask you guys to indulge me today, actually. As many of you know, Ron Franklin passed away last week. Um, and his funeral is actually going to be this coming Wednesday at 2 p.m. And Ron Franklin meant a lot to me in my early ministry here at McDougal when I was a youth minister here the first time around. He meant a lot to this community, obviously, right? And as we were sitting and planning the service, I did what they tell you you should never do, which is go down memory lane. And I've been thinking about a lot of the communion of saints that have gone before us from both of the communities that I have served who find themselves under one roof. The people of Ogden United Church have lost some of the most amazing people in the last several years. The people of McDougal United Church, likewise. And as we sat and we reminisced at the table, we reminisced not only about the people, but also some of their quirks. And in the middle of it all, there was a hymn that came up. Um, a hymn that came up was one that used to be belted out by a number of folks a number of years ago. Uh, with any opportunity that there was. And I kind of had this, huh, kind of moment, right? So I'm going to ask that you will just indulge me as we move into a difficult week. Um, if we could all stand and sing, will your anchor hold as a hymn to go out to into the week and into the world. Let us sing. this week into a world that is better because you are in it. Go out into the week and into the world knowing that you are not alone and God goes with you every step of the journey. Experience life. Share that experience and your experience with everyone that you meet. Be the hands and feet of love and mercy in all that you do. And know that wherever you go, God goes with you and you are loved and you are precious. Thank you for being you, for being who you are. You are wonderful 
beautiful, amazing people, and I am privileged to be here serving with you each and every day. Go in peace this day and always in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, Mother of us all. Amen.